we know each other from Twitter mm -hmm. and we've never met in person. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, you have been a statistician from birth, right? Like that is... <laughs> so. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. <laughs> right, like that is, that is, uh, you are many things, but that is primarily how we met and have interacted. And so I'm curious if it's true, like were you just born into statistics or did something <laughs> influence you to choose a career? <laughs> statistics unfortunately i was not born a statistician i do feel it was sort of in the stars for me um my grandfather is an applied mathematician and he basically my rough understanding of what he does is that he studies how to implement um, things like eigen decomposition with the limitations that computers have, because obviously computers don't store infinitely precise numbers. And so you have to like have some workarounds for how you compute things. Um, that is my rough approximation of what he does. So I think it was sort of like in my blood, but I took a detour. So when I was a kid, I was really good at math. Um, I even competed in the math Olympics a few times and won first place once um, and then cried when I didn't win first place the other times. Um, but I like had this weird thing where like I transitioned from private to public school as a kid. And so I, I was sort of like behind where I should have been and like barely missed the cutoff to get into the advanced math class when I transitioned to high school. And that sort of like put me off math. Like I still enjoyed it. I was still good at it, but I like had to repeat trig, I believe it is, or like geometry. And I was just like, Ugh, like, I don't like this. I can't do this. So I sort of took a detour until after college. Um, so I didn't love math, but I was good at it. And it should have been a sign to me that in college, my favorite philosophy class was logic, where we did like logic proofs. And that sort of set me on the path of like, oh, like I kind of like this technical work, even though I was a psychology major and took a psych class my senior year with the best professor I have ever had. I aspire to be as good as him one day. Um, and he just his love of statistics was very like contagious. And so then I was like, hmm, I kind of like this. And he communicated to us um, sort of tongue in cheek that like, if you pass this class, you will have better knowledge of statistics than most graduate students. And I was like, oh no, turns out that is true, <laughs> unfortunately. So I discovered that like other people aren't good at this and I am good at it. So I sort of decided, okay, like maybe I could do this, took a couple years off to work and decide and was like, oh, like I do like this. I am good at this. Other people hate it. So hopefully they'll pay me a lot of money to do it um, and went to grad school and became the statistician you met on Twitter. <laughs> so what were, what were you doing between um, undergrad and grad? You said you were working. What were you doing? I was still an academic. I oh. was the lab and data manager for a cognitive neuroscience lab. So I basically got in using my psych degree because I've done research in undergrad, mm -hmm. um, but told them in my interview, like, oh, I love statistics. And like, I would love to do your statistics. And of course, that's the magic words to say to psychology researchers, uh, because they largely don't have the resources to like do a lot of their own statistics. So I kind of got to have I wouldn't say the best of both worlds, but like have yeah. both worlds in one job, which really allowed me to decide like, which way do I want to go? Cause I wasn't sure. And it turns out statistics is the way I wanted to go. Um, but I also got into StatCom then because I saw how difficult it was for other mm -hmm. people around me, especially in psychology to understand the statistics that they were using. And this is even basic like t-tests, regressions, yeah. ANOVAs. And so I started writing about them. Um, Medium was just becoming a thing at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> I did that. And Chris Alvin um, messaged me randomly and was like, you should write for us. Do you remember when he had that podcast, Partially Derivative? Yes. With like, um, Vidya, Vidya 
I forget her last name and Jonathan I also forget his name sorry Chris is the only one that matters to me (laughs) just kidding um (laughs) We'll look it but, up. We'll drop it in the description. Yeah, we'll drop it. And so, I do. Yeah, it that was, was like, like a data science. It was the data the science podcast. podcast. Yeah, right, like because nothing had. I don't even Not think so standard deviations. I don't think had started yet. Um, I mean, Lucy data frames didn't exist. Yeah, like none yeah. of these existed. They were the ODs. That, yeah, <laughs> I kind of forgot that there at one point there was only one at one point because I feel like our market for data science content it's not saturated but there's so much out there that it's not that long ago that like one data science wasn't a career but also you couldn't find a data science podcast until yeah partially derivative okay so you so they wanted me to write for their they were trying to like expand their blog I think it was kind of short-lived because obviously Mm -hmm. they stopped the podcast as well um but I wrote for them some like I think we called it the data science dictionary and it was um explaining common data science slash stats concepts with my oh my god this was back when I drew with a Muji 0.38 um gel ink pen and then scanned in my oh god that was that when you made when you made my pork because you went no that was right after Yes, okay. I did. And I should do more of those. I, um, Chris was one of my first ones. So he kind of inspired me to do that, but yeah. So I wrote for them and then I started, I think through that okay, going on Twitter, um, and meeting people like you, I did what Jesse is talking about is I watercolored a bunch of stats and data science people, both like current and like, you know, Fisher, like old, um, as, cats and as porgs yes. you can see actually I don't know if you can see I have Julia Silge's okay um, yes this is the Julia Silge yes. porg one and then there's William Seeley Gossett and then Lucy <laughs> hugging a Chewbacca as a cat watercolor um hanging up there but yeah so I went through that and that actually helped me meet like some random data science people that I admire because I did Mara as well and I think that's how I met her okay officially on Twitter yeah (laughs) yeah and then you were it was that was that your kind of introduction to the R world on Twitter because I think for people who don't know the R the R programming language you know R for data science that community is largely on Twitter whereas if you use Python for data science or machine learning I think they are kind of all over the place there's not necessarily a strong Twitter code they're there everybody's on Twitter but like the R community lives on Twitter. Is that where you kind of? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm trying to think, but yeah, I think that is where I got into like the R stats community because I would tweet like both resources that I had made for basic R stuff as well as questions because I was still Mm -hmm. learning because by the way, no one told me to learn how to code until my senior year of college. This was back in 2015, but like that just seems unthinkable now that like yeah. no one would tell you, yeah. hey, you might want to learn how to code <laughs> um, until you're like yeah. almost out the door. Yeah, I learned, I was working on my PhD. I was in my second year of my PhD and I didn't want to take the intro to stats class because I had taken intro to stats in undergrad. And I was like, mm-hmm. I know what a T-test is. I don't need to do this. Um, That's all that so matters. <laughs> talked myself into um, multivariate statistics and wow that's a jump (laughs) from a t-test to multivariate is a big jump (laughs) immediately I remember I was in this it's a huge graduate hall there's an 11 year old genius in my class with her mother so (laughs) who knows so everything (laughs) it's so intimidating she was lovely and brilliant but like I was oh gosh what was I I was in my late 20s I think and like really struggling and she would just come and she would like raise their hand and she would know the answers and we would all just be like what um but my professor very much said like we're doing R like you are going Mm. to code in this class and you're going to code using R and I remember I was so proud I had a MacBook and I had to use the the standard interface because there was I think it was R Commander. There was this like nice interface. This is pre R Studio. 
Um, and I think it was our commander and I was trying to get it to run on a Mac. And like, I went to office hours and my instructor is like, she's like, I'm sorry. I don't think you can. <gasps> and I was like, what? what a different time. <laughs> Although that still happens because when I took my Bayesian class, we used, um, did we use wind bugs? We use bugs. Like one of the yeah. Bayesian samplers is called okay. bugs. And it wasn't available for Max, unlike, you know, like Stan or Jack, like everything. all of those yeah. things. And I had to do like an emulator or something on my computer. So like, I totally get what you were experiencing. Right. How and like, did you resolve it? I just learned to use the standard interface. Oh. And like, that was it. And I remember I was, so I was in a research-based PhD program. So I had to take a stats class as part of my curriculum, but I was working in a lab full time. Um, and so I used R to do the statistics for our lab. I was the stats person. I loved it. I was like, yes. <laughs> With no R state. Oh my gosh. It was what a time. <laughs> wild. So, so this does bring up something for me. You know, when I took statistics, I, I had never heard until I met you, I had never heard the word Bayesian. <laughs> Okay. Like at all. Right. Like I don't even think when I took statistics, we even called it frequentist statistics. They never it, do. It was just statistics. Mm -hmm. And so you come on the scene and you're like, <laughs> let me tell you all about Bayes. Um, so could you give us like an explain it like I'm five? <laughs> what what oh are my you gosh. talking about? Yeah. I people ask me this all the time and I never feel like I give a good answer to this. Um, because I am a practitioner of Bayesian statistics, okay. but I am not the expert. Um, but my favorite way to describe Bayesian statistics is actually Michael Betancourt at Beta and Alpha on Twitter. Um, his pinned tweet says, what makes you Bayesian is quantifying uncertainty using mm. probability. Okay. Um, and so I, I could give you a bunch of like different math definitions of how like the way that we do tests and stuff like that in Bayesian statistics is a little different. Um, but I think that really encapsulates it. So in Bayesian statistics, you might always hear about like updating your beliefs, like you take mm -hmm. new priors, which is what you believe before seeing the data. And then through math, you update that prior with the information from your data and get your posterior, which is um, basically your updated belief. So now that we combined the evidence and what you thought before, what do you think now? Mm -hmm. um, and so we do inference on that. And there's a ton of different schools of Bayesian statistics. So for instance, the thing that I use a lot is Bayesian parameter estimation. So you may see on Twitter, for instance, people posting like these beautiful posterior distributions, um, which essentially these distributions represent like how likely are these different values given both our prior and the mm. information that we have from our data? And I, I think there's something really intuitive about that. And it's such a good tool that is overlooked because it really, as Michael Badencourt says, quantifies uncertainty about your estimates mm -hmm. using probability. And so instead of being shoehorned into this, um, null hypothesis significance testing framework, which is how people teach frequentist statistics. It is not, I don't want to get anyone mad at me. It is not the only way to do frequentist stats. And there's, you know, some great ways of doing it. Um, not that way, but that's the way that a lot of people are like used to seeing it. And, um, it really shoves you into this box of hypothesis testing, like what's your mm -hmm. null and like reject it. When a lot of times I think the questions we want to answer have more to do with estimation, not like testing mm -hmm. a hypothesis and Bayesian statistics does that really well. Um, of course, you also have the added bonus that people critique a lot, which is you can incorporate external information into your analysis. Um, people okay. say that that's not objective. Um, and so they don't like that. And I think there are some situations where that is a valid criticism. But if you're thinking about the, the places that we use it the most, which mm -hmm. is you know, research or industry, like making decisions and marketing or something like that, you often know something about your data, yeah. even if it's not like a super strong belief. And so I think having to um, quantify and justify those through your priors 
and then incorporating that into your analysis is Mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, And I've made some jokes about this before that people did not like, um, but it was basically this idea of like, we use regularization a lot, even in frequent statistics. So things like lasso or ridge, where you're saying, oh, I think a lot of my effects are near zero or at zero, um, which, you know, helps with overfitting in your model, blah, blah, blah. But I make fun of that because I'm like, you are encoding information about your effect. Mm -hmm. Like you can also, like there's Bayesian equivalents to doing that. Um, The only difference is like, you just don't like when your priors are not centered around zero. Like, but people have a lot of arguments that are better than mine, but like, I kind of go like, look, you're already encoding information about your effects. Like why Mm -hmm. are you not okay encoding, you know, some location data like saying oh it's okay. probably centered around one or something like that um anyway I went off on a tangent there no, it's- Asian statistics is really good for incorporating prior information and quantifying uncertainty using probability and I think okay. it allows you to ask um some different questions in traditional statistics and people often overlook it as a tool leading them to kind of shoehorn their hypotheses and their research questions into a null hypothesis significance testing Mm -hmm. framework when really they could maybe benefit in that situation from a different tool. tool. So you're in graduate school, do they make you choose, like what I'm driving at is why Bayesian statistics, right? So I'm imagining you've got to like face this choice of, oh, I've got to, I've got to go to the frequentist school or I've got to go to the Bayesian school. Like how, like, how did you choose to go into kind of this branch of statistics? Um, I would say that I didn't necessarily choose to go into the branch of statistics. It just fit the problems Mm. that I was using. Um, because most of the things that I wanted to do were not hypothesis tests. Um, so of course you can do Bayesian hypothesis tests, you know, whatever. Um, but I, I thought there was, at least at the time, I felt there was like a little more thought that had to go into, you know, justifying and quantifying priors and typically in Bayesian statistics, there's some good tools out there now, but like you, you sort of have to build everything from scratch. You didn't have like an LM <laughs> that you could throw things into. Um, and I'm trying to, like, as I learn more and do more now, I'm trying to disentangle that, which is more a software issue mm-hmm. from the true tenets of frequentism versus Bayesian yeah. statistics. Um, but I think that that was what drew me to it is I had a lot more control and customization over my models. I was able to do things like regularize my Mm -hmm. estimates and and put informative priors on them, even if it was just a prior that was like, oh, based on what I know about this particular scale, I'm going to encode like information about what I think the effect size is. Um, That was really appealing to me. And I also think the way that you present Bayesian results made a little more sense to my brain (laughs) because you're saying like, what is the probability of this effect given priors Mm -hmm. and evidence? Um, Whereas frequentists are not presenting their results that way. However, I I made a joke. So when I was writing Crash Course, um, I wrote a couple episodes about p-values and got some comments on Twitter from Daniel Lockins, which is how I met him on Twitter. Um, And he said, I guess it's okay, which from him I felt was very high praise. Um, But we were talking about the episodes because, you know, I still had a very negative like p-values, please, no. Um, And he and I basically discussed that I was sort of in a p-value angst phase. And that he thought I was going to grow out of it. I am still firmly like I prefer and I really like Bayesian tools Mm -hmm. um, because they really solve like numerically some issues like models that you couldn't fit in frequentist models. You can with Bayesian statistics because you're you're basically incorporating outside information. So it's like no free lunch, like you have to get it from Mm -hmm. somewhere. But that extra information allows you to fit models that wouldn't be possible with frequentist stats Um, anyway. I think I'm sort of starting to come out of my p-value angst phase. Um, So I'm still very anti-null hypothesis significance testing 
but I'm no longer like that angsty about frequentist statistics. So who knows if you ask me in five years, <laughs> maybe things will change again. <laughs> Uh, this this is amazing because my hunch, and I, I did not follow through on it, was just to open this whole conversation and saying, so Chelsea, what's the deal with p-values? And then sitting back. <laughs> and I felt like that would have taken the oh entire episode. <laughs> I have a lot to say. <laughs> so so kind of kind of related to that, but not really. So we've talked about sliced quite a mm -hmm. bit. Um, and for people who don't know, I'll put some links, but sliced was a... Um, I guess machine learning reality show competition hosted game show, by game show <laughs> um, for nerds, uh, hosted by Nick Wan and Meg Rizdahl. Basically, we got together, there were brackets, and four people were given a data set to do machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were a variety of ways that you were scored and ranked. And you've often said in our conversations that you would love to do sliced. Mm -hmm but it's a two hour time constraint. And that's, that would make your work really challenging. So how does like Bayesian modeling and all of that fit into the broader field of machine learning? That's a good question. I think that if you're really doing machine learning, you're not going to be using like an inferential Bayesian okay. model. Um, but the ideas of Bayesian statistics like really permeate through the field of machine learning. For instance, um, optimization, like uh, doing hyperparameter tuning, there's a lot of like Bayesian ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so you're basically incorporating prior information about what hyperparameters might be good or like how to find those hyperparameters. And that can speed things up. Cause as you know, even when you're doing machine learning, you know, you're like your XG boost or whatever, <laughs> it can take a long time to train your models and like yeah. tune the hyperparameters. And so using these ideas of like bringing in prior information can be really, really helpful. Okay. Um, so those ideas, I think, come through more than like the type of Bayesian modeling, like inferential Bayesian modeling that like researchers often use. I mean, even in the often taught, not often used <laughs> algorithm of naive Bayes, um, which you always hear where people will like classify ham and spam emails, so like real and um, like add emails. Um, we use like Bayes rule, which is also the foundation of Bayesian statistics. And it's this idea that you're updating your belief about how likely an email is to be spam. Mm -hmm. Let's say 10% of emails are spam. You're updating that belief with the evidence based on, you know, whether it contains the word Viagra or whether right. it has a link in it or something like that. Um, so I think it permeates through, but yeah, I mean, I've, I always hear about like Bayesian elements of machine learning, but it, no one is <laughs> pulling up Stan <laughs> when they're trying to do um, machine learning. I will say that it is really good for, um, I wouldn't quite call it predictive modeling, but like if you have posterior distributions about your effects, you can sample from them. And so mm -hmm. you can say like, oh, like what would happen in this case? And then draw a bunch of simulations and like present that to the shareholders. Um, but yeah, it's not, maybe I should pay more attention, but it's not something I hear a lot where people are like, oh yeah, pulled out my stand model to build a <laughs> machine learning model and put it into production. Like, I don't know <laughs> that that happens super often. I, I have no idea. Um, I was reading something, I can't even remember what, and it was talking about how, when we talk about machine learning in production, it's linear models, right? It's linear regression it's just linear regression all the way down. Yeah, that's what we're doing, or for sure, <laughs> like heuristics, mm -hmm. uh, which makes me feel better about the, mach the machine learning I did um, mm -hmm. and the modeling I did in my earlier data science career. Because so I was like, ah, this is, I'm not <laughs> using anything fancy. Um, don't need to usually. I just made a tweet about that and it was so funny. I think it was something about how people get mad when you say that a lot of times linear regression does just mm -hmm. fine. And some of the reactions to my tweet were like exactly the reactions that the meme was making fun of where people were like, mm, like angry. <laughs> and so people were like, well, I don't know. And I was like, well, like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> this is what the meme is about. <laughs> so, so that brings up another question that, I mean, very serious question. Um, how did you get to be so funny? And is this something <laughs> that you practice? 
Like, do um, you workshop your memes on Tony or? Sometimes, but he, so Tony, my husband is a video editor. So he does not necessarily have the technical background to find me that funny. Um, but he is really like my best TikToks and my best tweets are usually things that he thinks of because the best performing social media posts are things that everyone can understand Mm -hmm. and so if Tony can understand it everyone can understand it so they're very popular but he doesn't appreciate sort of my like niche little jokes which are my favorite thing ever uh to write like I I, I think I have an example. example. <laughs> I, I okay, think I have an example. So when I think of TikTok, when I think of you on TikTok, the one that I always think of is uh, like his house, my, my neighbor's house or something. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> yes. And so I'll link from to Borat. it. But yes, it's from Borat. <laughs> and it's comparing like Python mm-hmm. and R and primarily uh-huh. the tidyverse. And it mm-hmm. has, it's, I'm not going to spoil it. It has a great setup the punchline, the delivery, everything is amazing, right? And no language wars here, all languages are valid, et cetera, et cetera. But it's mm-hmm. it's funny. <laughs> um, and then when I think of something that's very niche, I saw mm-hmm. one of your tweets and it was this, I mean, I, I was, I see all of your, not all of them. I did go through a bunch of them today in case, you know, all of the hearts that you saw come through. But it was this child, <laughs> like did. lovingly looking at, I think bread, uh, at bread and it was like, <laughs> I don't even it was like I was like Asians and half koshi prior yeah I say I didn't even know how to pronounce it so I was like oh gosh I've got myself in trouble already and I was like oh this is like a super niche tweet that that like Chelsea finds really funny and if I knew what was happening I would find this funny too so Uh, yeah that was a great tweet I am always shocked at how I honestly think I come off more Bayesian on Twitter than I am in like practice because the memes are just so good. But um, yeah, I think that's a good example of niche content where, so a Koshi distribution is basically a distribution that sort of looks like a normal distribution, but it has infinite variants. Basically it has really fat tails. So if you have extreme events that are going to happen, those are always going to happen in the tails. Mm -hmm. And it basically assigns more probability to those happening. It is kind of a I think one of my professors called it a distribution made up by mathematicians to make statistics like statisticians look stupid Um, because infinite variance is not something that we can work with. Like most distributions have finite variance. So anyway, so um, we like it because it has fat tails. It has like extreme events, but it's kind of bell shaped. It's a symmetric, nice, Mm -hmm. almost normal looking curve. So a half Cauchy is where you cut the distribution in half. So you only have the positive values and we use it as a prior for variance. So if you don't know what the variance or the standard deviation of your model should be, it has to be positive, right? And it usually is going to be small, but like you want to have the possibility that there are extreme values. So we love half Cauchy priors. Um, That But people are obsessed with it because, you know, no one knows what to set their priors to. Um, And I think Gelman and someone else recommended half Koshi priors. So like now it's just like, that's what people do. And I was just like making fun of it. But like a lot of people respond, like more than you think would respond to that. Um, So I keep making the Bayesian memes. (laughs) Well, I think one thing that strikes me about your Bayesian memes is I've learned a little bit about Bayesian (laughs) statistics just (laughs) just from the memes like sometimes I'll see one of your memes and I'll be like I want to get the joke so I'll google it and I'll be like oh (laughs) now I get the joke right Uh, that's my goal I've had a couple people message me or like comment on my tweets saying that and that is the best feedback that I can ever get because my whole goal I mean I'm not like going into it being calculated I think I am just weird Mm -hmm. and I like expressing the things that I'm learning or thinking about through memes but like in the background of my mind is this idea that like I want to get people excited about statistics motivate them to learn and help them feel like they belong and I think that memes are a really good way to do that so it makes me really excited when they're like exactly what you said they kind of see like there's a joke and like people are reacting to this because I think the fact that you see other people liking it and commenting on it makes you feel like oh like what's there? Like, why do they think it's funny? Um, and I think there's something really fun about that. And like, I've had a couple people say like, 
my goal is to learn enough statistics to understand your memes. And that just makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, abso- absolutely. Like, would do you, do you see a meme and you're like, like, where do you get your memes? Like my brain, I don't know. I mean, I have a couple of ways. So I've actually tried to be a little more regular about it because mm-hmm. uh, I'm work full-time as a non-tenure track professor. So my semesters can get a little chaotic. So I've been trying to actually bulk make memes and schedule them to go out every day. Um, but so like in that case, usually what I'll do is I'll either go on Reddit um, there's a subreddit called meme templates official and people just like share meme templates that they think are fun. And I'll like go through and just save them periodically or go on, like, I forget what the site is. There's some site that like hosts meme templates and I'll just go on and be like, these look fun. Um, and so then I just have a folder on my phone of like blank memes. And if I need to come up with a meme or if I think of something, I'll just like create it then. But I think the best ones that I come up with are spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. Like I'm thinking about this thing. Like I recently did a tweet about like, if your girl is um, pleasingly symmetrical, normal-ish and has fat tails, little peach emoji that's not your girl that's a t distribution with two degrees of freedom like that I literally was like lying in bed (laughs) thinking about t distribution and I was like this would be a really good joke and so I wrote it out but it was like 11 p.m and everyone in Europe's asleep so I just like saved it as a draft and like when I woke up the next morning tweeted it um And so I think like those tend to be my like best, most Mm. inspired memes. Cause like, I always make the joke that like, you can tell what I'm working on by looking at the memes that I post, because I'm always like making jokes about things that I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. Um, That being said, with a husband who's like also kind of in content, we are trying to like do more scripting and planning of like TikToks and stuff like that. So it's a mix, but like my heart is most in the ones where it's like, oh, this would make a good mm-hmm. joke and like immediately firing off that tweet. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So one thing that you've tweeted about um, is Frasier. Yeah. And oh I I don't even know where to start. So I, I have, you have multiple threads about Frasier on Twitter, uh, which well, I did there's not Frasier realize. stats memes and there's yes. the Frasier project I did over the summer. Okay. So... Those so are the two us, main threads. Okay, yes, because I've seen like the Fraser stats memes, and then I saw one where someone was like, "Oh, the Fraser project is happening," but it was like 2019, and I was like, "No, it, it was definitely sooner." Like that, the Fraser project is more recent. Can you tell what is the Fraser project? And okay, we are talking about that... like tossed salad and scrambled eggs. Like <laughs> we are talking about the TV show. Yes. Yes. Um, and I am 29. I don't want people to think that like I'm. Anyway, are you calling I, me very, old? I'm like, not are calling you, you old, <laughs> but people are always like, <sighs> Frasier's kind of like knowing how old you are. I would not have like I watched exactly. Frasier in like late middle school, early high school. I was very into Frasier. It was like on as a kid. I think yeah. my parents might have watched it occasionally, um, but I actually didn't have a TV until I was like ten. Um, so I don't think. I was like watching it live, but I always have, I feel like I have to acknowledge that because people are like, like what? Like, why do you like (laughs) Frasier so much? Um, I got into it because of binging with Babish. Do you know when he first started his theme song was the tossed salad and scrambled eggs. Okay. Um, And he's like a Frasier super fan. And so I was like, oh, that sounds kind of good. So I started watching it. So I think what that person was probably referring to on Twitter is I, um, wanted to do some technical stuff this summer because as a teacher during the year, my, my time is filled up with like technical, but like teaching technical, Mm -hmm. like I'm not getting my hands dirty. And so I decided to scrape the web for every Frasier script and then do some analyses. Um, Julia Silge's book, Mm -hmm. so good. She has a, a book about like text modeling with R. So like you know, scripts are all text. So it really helped. Um, and so basically what I did was I sort of broke it down into like the things I wanted to 
do or learn. And the first thing was like, I haven't done any web scraping since grad mm-hmm. school um, and early grad school at that. So I was like, I want to do that again. So I got out like my, um, what was the pa- Arvest? Is that what yeah, the package called? Yeah. yeah. Um, and web <laughs> scraped. There's this like random person hosting a 90s style website that has all of the scripts. And so I scraped them Um, put them into txt files and then had to figure out like well what do I want to learn about these so I then had to dive into regular expressions again which is something that like Mm -hmm. it's not that I wanted to review it but I was like it's been a while I should do this Um, and so I had to use regular expressions to pull what people said so for instance Mm -hmm. like what pattern could I use to grab every word that Frazier says excluding stage directions you know excluding lines from other people So that was a huge challenge. Um, But once I had that, I could do some text analysis. So for instance, um, I did something where I grabbed all the punctuation. This Mm -hmm. is something we do a lot with like literature. So like we'll pull like Jane Austen versus Hemingway and we'll look at like, what do their punctuation um, marks look like? So I did that and that was really interesting because you see a lot of like um, the places where they have like exclamation points and questions, which tend Mm -hmm. to be more like, emphatic like things and then you have like regular sentences and you have all the colons for when people talk and like it was really interesting to see that um I also did what I do I think I did some sentiment analysis on the Fraser scripts as well um so we looked at like how the the sentiment of the episodes changed both throughout the entirety of Frasier as well as within season. And I'm forgetting what the patterns were now, but there were some really interesting patterns um, that when I went back and watched those episodes, like made sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was really fun to see that. I tried to topic model it. I don't know if this is a problem with all TV scripts or not, but my topics were like horrible. I think I need some Frasier specific stop words Mm. because every topic was like Niles, Frasier, dad, radio, like (laughs) they weren't very like informative topics. Um, and so that's where I ended with the summer, but that was my little Frasier analysis project. And I'm hoping to, I need to, um, write something up, but I'm hoping like at certain student clubs I'll like give talks throughout the year I'm kind of hoping to be like oh like I did this Frasier analysis and then talk about web scraping and regular expressions and topic modeling and stuff like that yeah that's such a great example of having something you're interested in and having the baseline skills and then just going for it so where are that we've talked a lot about your web presence where are the good (laughs) places on the web for people to find you That's a good question. Twitter is going to be the biggest place to find me. I spend too much time there. So my handle there is at Chelsea Parlett. Um, And then TikTok would be another good place to find me. I'm a little more sporadic there, um, but I post, I wouldn't call it more educational, but like material that's sort of targeted at people who are still learning, where sometimes my Twitter stuff can get a little advanced. Um, and then other places to find me would be, you can find me on my personal website. I think yes. it's something like cmparlettepelleridi.github.io. <laughs> Jesse <laughs> will link it. Um, Absolutely. But I, for instance, like post a lot of the things I write there mm-hmm. or um, I've recently, so shiny for Python um, has really gigantic URLs because if you don't know the code is encoded I know Jesse knows the code is encoded in the URL so your URLs are like really long so I also have a list of all of the uh like shiny apps that I've been using pedagogically in class because I need a place to like store those links and things like bit.ly and like twitter won't allow links of that size um so you can go find all of that there (laughs) 